Hello friend and welcome or welcome back to my channel. Three words I want you to keep in mind today. Real, raw, and ready. Today we're going to be taking a look at Psalm 51, which is a prayer of repentance straight from the heart of King David. And it happens after this really dark time in his life. Now I know a lot of us can identify with what it means to make a mistake. I mean like when you really mess up and you are wondering if God can ever really truly forgive you. Well, Psalm 51 is going to show us that no matter how far we've fallen, God is ready to cleanse us, renew us, and restore us. God wants us to know that His mercy is so much greater than our mistakes, and He really just wants us to come to Him with a heart that is raw, real, and ready for change. So in today's lesson, we're going to break down what true repentance looks like, and we're going to discover how God's forgiveness completely transforms our lives. So grab everything that you need to study, your Bibles, your journals, your pens, your handy dandy notebooks. It's time for us to get into this lesson. Hello to every one of you. Hello, TSSG family. Hello, TSSG family. You're in the TSSG space. Well, hello, TSSG family. Sunday, 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 Sunday School. Changing the way you see Sunday School with that Sunday School. Girl. Hello, TSSG family, and welcome to the International Lesson Review for Sunday, October 6th. My name is Waynell, you're in the TSSG space, and here I share Christian content that is largely inspired by and or based on our Sunday School lessons. I do serve the International and the Church of God in Christ lesson communities, and I am your reviewer for this week's lesson entitled, Prayers of Repentance and Confession. If this is your first time here, I wanna say welcome to you. I'm not sure how you found us, but I am so glad that you're here. Now that you're here, we want to make you family. So everyone, please look down below. Make sure that you have clicked that subscribe button. Also take the extra step of clicking that notifications bell because I don't want you to miss any of the content when it is uploaded on this channel. And there are great things happening here. God is growing us. And I'm just excited about the digital evangelism that God continues to allow us to do for more than nine and a half years we've been in this space sharing with you and I appreciate you so please share this lesson somewhere in your space whether it's in your social media text the link to someone but invite someone to this community and let them know that we are learning and growing together in the Word of God now before we get into this lesson I was looking at one of the edits on the first clip and I remembered uh, it's not you it's not your screen you probably paused and said what is that on her hand I pinched my finger last week closing a closet door and so I ended up with a blood welt so I know that I use my hands when I talk and I don't want it to be a distraction but yeah, pray for my little finger it's getting better and I'm sure there's a lesson in here somewhere I'll think about it one day and figure out what is the lesson that God wants me to have besides don't close the closet door like that with your palm use the handle anyway let's get into the lesson for this week we're going to Psalm 51 and there's some jumping around in here but honestly I've got my Bible here and uh, these lessons for me I know I've been approaching them a little bit differently but I continue to share that I am not just a YouTuber who's here to uh, grow a brand. I am a real Sunday school teacher. I'm a Sunday school superintendent. And so when I am studying, it is for the ministry that I do in my local church. And my space here on YouTube allows me to share in what I consider the overflow and make friends who want to talk about the Sunday school lesson. So there may be other parts that I pull into it, but our printed text is going to be verses one through four. We'll look at verses 10 through 12 and then verses 15 through 17. Our memory verse is gonna be verse 10, and our lesson angel that we will summarize the circumstances that led to King David uh, writing Psalm 51, interpret Psalm 51 through the lens of King David's experience of repentance and forgiveness, and confess and repent of personal and corporate sins. If you're interested in the TSSG notes, the 20 questions, or the kid pack for this lesson, you can click the link in the description box down below. It is always an immediate download. On your final screen, you should see a download button, and you will immediately be able to download and have access to your resources to help you with this study. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for 
just another opportunity to study your word. We never take these moments for granted. In fact, we love your word and we desire your word and we desire most of all to know um, how we are to be better people as a result of studying your word. So God, as we take in this lesson on confession and repentance, God, cause our hearts to be softened and open to ways that we may need to repent and that we can be open and know that you're always in a position ready to hear us and to forgive us. Let us know that you love us and that repentance is not a bad thing, but it's the space that you create for us to get back in right relationship with you. I pray that you'll bless everyone who's present now and anyone who catches subsequent replays. We love you. We give you glory in Jesus name. Amen. All right, let's go to Psalm 51. And I'll read from my notes because my personal Bible is not a King James version. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Verse 15. O Lord, Open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else I would give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O God, thou will not despise. This is our reading for this week. Again, as we go into this conversation on this prayer of repentance and of confession, we are in Psalms this week and we're going into a new unit of study. And this unit of study is about songs of the Old Testament. Y'all already know I love Old Testament study and um, I love just the connectedness and how you can go back and find uh, typically like things that reference each other and really start to fill in those blanks. And we'll be able to do that as we take a look at Psalm 51. Psalms is the 19th book of the Old Testament. And the Psalms are written by different authors. So King David is one of those authors, but he did not write all of the Psalms. You've got Asaph who wrote Psalms, the sons of Korah, Solomon, Ethan, uh, the Ezra height. There are so many authors of the Psalms, but they are different styles. They are worship and prayer, reflection and meditation. And some of the Psalms are even instruction. So across the Psalms, there are actually five divisions. And I give you all these in the TSSG notes, if you're interested in how those Psalms are broken out. And in Psalm Psalm 51, we are in the second division or book of Psalms, which is kind of this mix of Psalms that are attributed to different authors. And they explore themes of like lament and trust and the rulership of God. In our lessons, you know, I love to identify our cast of characters. And yes, even in the Psalms, you can identify the characters. And the main person that we'll see here is David. David, this is King David. And here he is pouring out his feelings of guilt. And we're going to talk about why he's feeling the way he's feeling. But he's also wanting something like the deepest parts of him uh, wants God's forgiveness. He recognizes his mistake. And so he's putting himself in a place uh, to ask for the mercy, the forgiveness of God. So King David is one of those. He's one of the most famous kings of the Bible, right? Um, he starts as this humble shepherd boy and God chooses him to be the king of Israel after Saul falls out of favor with him. So David is best known for defending and killing Goliath. And he did that with a slingshot and you know smooth stones. And now we look at him as this skilled warrior. He's a beloved king. And he's known for uniting the tribes of Israel and expanding the nation's territory. So I give you that background so that you know, like he is a very accomplished man, a very admired man, um, a very skilled individual. But at the same time, David is imperfect. He was not a perfect man. He's made some serious mistakes. And the biggest one we're going to talk about in this week's lesson is his sin with Bathsheba. So despite his failures, though, 
He is called a man after God's own heart. And he's called that because he always gets to this place of repentance. He always knows that more than anything, he seeks and he desires the will of God. So his life shows that time and time again, when he's made terrible decisions, that God's grace was still available to him. And I think that's going to become important. And it's an important part of his life. And I think a huge takeaway that we can have as well, that God's grace is always available to us. So the next character in our lesson is absolutely going to be God himself. Uh, God is the one that David is addressing in his prayer of confession, and he is dependent on the character, the nature of God, his love, his mercy, and the fact that God stands ready to forgive. And although the Israelites are not directly mentioned in this passage, in a broader sense, you know, there are people who would observe, people who knew what went on with King David and who are able to learn from his experience and certainly to see what repentance actually looks like. And I'll try to explain that more fully as we get into sort of the background of this text. So Psalm 51 is really born out of one of what I consider like the darkest periods in the life of King David, but it was also, you know, a very pivotal moment in his life as well. You have to go back to 2 Samuel uh, chapters 11 and 12, and you can also look in 1 Kings chapters 1 and 2, and you'll find where this all really begins. So David is on the rooftop one day, and he sees a woman. She is beautiful, and she is at her own self house, minding her own self business. And she is bathing. This woman's name is Bathsheba. And she is the wife of Uriah. Uriah is one of uh, the leaders who is out in battle. And David is absolutely captivated by the beauty of this woman. And he allows his fleshly de desire to overpower his sense of what is right and what is wrong. And so he calls for Bathsheba. And she does come over and the two of them participate in an affair. And this results in her becoming pregnant. So this is really sort of the first of a series of really bad decisions that David is going to make because he doesn't now just have this moment of lust, which turns into an affair. Uh, but now he's in a space where there's an issue because there's a baby on the way. So he is going to work really hard to cover up his sin. So he tries to hide the affair. How does he do that? He brings Uriah home from the fighting field and uh, her husband is home from battle. And what he's hoping is that the husband is going to be so excited to be home and be with his wife and have those opportunities to be intimate with her, making it look like there would be a child conceived while he was home from the battle. But Uriah was like this seriously loyal soldier. He refused to enjoy the comforts of home and the time with his wife. There was no way he could do that, you know, with other soldiers still being out on the field and in battle. So David's plan fails and Uriah refuses to sleep with his wife. And so David sees no other way at this point to cover up his affair and the resulting pregnancy. So he takes an even more drastic measure. He is desperate because he's trying to conceal sin. And that's the thing about sin, right? It will take you further than you want it to go, keep you longer than you want it to stay. And there is this unpredictability of sin. You can't always say where it's going, what the end of sin is going to be. And so David really devises what is an incredibly chilling plan to eliminate Uriah. He wants Uriah out of the picture. So he writes a letter to Joab, who is this commanding officer, and he's got explicit instructions to place Uriah on the front line of the battle. So when the battle and the fighting becomes more intense, Uriah is on the front line. But David's plan doesn't stop there. He wants to ensure that Uriah is not going to survive. So he commands Joab that when the fighting gets intense to pull back the other soldiers, which would leave Uriah exposed, it would leave him vulnerable and pretty much become his death sentence. And that's not even it. Like, that's bad. But what's more tragic is David has Uriah to carry his own death orders back to Joab because he's unaware of the contents of the letter. 
Um, Uriah is this loyal guy. Clearly he follows instructions and he is loyal to David. He is loyal to his comrades. And so even, even though David betrays him in the most grievous way, Uriah follows instructions. And so once Uriah is killed in battle, then David's thinking, problem solved, crisis averted, we're good. And he quickly marries Bathsheba. And he thinks he has successfully covered up his tracks. But this does not go unnoticed by God. Like that's the thing about sin. You can think that you are fully getting away with the thing, but it does not go unnoticed by God. His actions have displeased God. And it wasn't long before uh, a prophet named Nathan comes to David and he confronts David. And he uses this really powerful parable about uh, a man and his ewe lamb. And he reveals to David just how deep his sin really is. And this moment of realization is really what broke David. And this is what leads him to writing Psalm 51. This is a Psalm of repentance. Again, there are different kinds of Psalms and this one is of repentance. He is seeking God's mercy and he wants God to clean him up, to cleanse him of his guilty heart. So after you know Nathan confronts David and exposes his sin, this weight, this guilt, this moral failure is what David has to deal with. And I just want to set that as a premise like that is where sin leaves us. Sin is intended to make us guilty. It's not just the things that we do, but it is the things that make us guilty in the eyes of God. Sin is a thing that we can't fix ourselves. It's something that we cannot clean up ourselves. So as we explore, you know, this particular Psalm, we're dealing with like David's inner turmoil. He is dealing with the consequences of his actions. And because he knows the depth of his wrong, he really, like truly desires restoration with God. So Psalm 51, let's take a look at it. And I'll say this before we dig a little bit deeper. You know, I wanted to ask, you know, who do I think that this Psalm resonates with today? Because it is so easy to just jump in and tell David's story. But I think all of us at some point have referenced you know, wrestled with our own failure, our own human experience, our own sin, things that we've done that we've regretted and really longed for a grace that would cover or forgive the things that we have done. We've looked for that space to be reconciled. So if you have, or if you are dealing with any kind of emotional or spiritual turmoil, like guilt and regret, like if you've made a decision that has seriously wronged someone else, You'll find comfort in the fact that David is able to acknowledge sin and that there is a space to ask for forgiveness. If there is any shame in anything that you have done that you're dealing with, you'll find a space in here in this lesson. Sometimes sin leads us to feel really broken. So if you are experiencing brokenness, whether it's emotional brokenness or even spiritual brokenness from a personal failure, you know, even relationship issues, this is a great space. Um, just a desire for change, right? We talk about um, revival and, you know, God send revival. Well, a lot of times revival begins in you, right? Revival is an individual thing before it's a corporate thing. So look how David, you know, approaches this space of uh, feeling stuck, feeling stuck in his pattern of negative behavior. Um, he really wants this renewed relationship with God. And that's what the thing is. The thing about um, what I consider revival and renewal, it has to come from a place within that desires right relationship with God. So it's also a great song for anyone who just struggles with faith, especially after failing in a certain way and wanting to give up because you didn't live up to an expectation. This is a great space because it shows us um, how we can be honest with God and we can come into a space that is really vulnerable in our conversation with God and he sits ready to hear us. Verse one through four. This is a plea for pardon. David is crying out to God. He's asking for forgiveness and he is acknowledging what he has done. So he opens up with this raw and honest cry for mercy. This is not just a casual like, forgive me. Right. He's like deeply aware of just how badly he has messed up. 
His actions with Bathsheba and Uriah have caused some serious damage. And now he is really desperate to repair his broken relationship with God because his sin was not just against man, but he even says that his sin was against God. So in these verses, David is really showing us what real repentance looks like. And real repentance is more than just the words. Real repentance is more than just, I'm sorry, or forgive me. It is, and I said, forgive me. I said it that way for a reason, because sometimes we just breeze over some, oh, forgive me. No, it, these are like, this is taking full responsibility and not hiding behind the issues. So first we see David here crying out for mercy. He is appealing to the fact that he knows that God's love never fails. We may fail. But God's love doesn't fail. So this is a cry for repentance. And I know you've heard me say this before if you've been in this space, but repentance is not a bad word. Repentance is not an ugly thing. It is truly the opportunity for us to position ourselves in a space to just get back in right relationship with God. But repentance is also recognizing that we've broken God's heart and it's a commitment you know, to turn from our ways and not to hurt God in that way again. And so he is repenting. He is leaning on the love of God. He is leaning on the covenant love of God and knowing that God has deep compassion. He's not counting his own goodness. This, there's nothing that he can do to earn forgiveness, but instead he is throwing himself on God's character and he knows that God's love and his compassion are bigger than his sin. He knows that he needs God's mercy that he does not deserve, that he cannot earn. And as you look at the structure of this psalm, I actually un underline in my Bible all of like the ways that he calls God into what he's got going on, the actions that he's requesting of God. And I found 11 actions that go along with this repentance. I noticed that uh, like in a, we live in a space where people are, you know, always looking for five steps to or three ways to come out of. And here David just brings himself. And he calls for God to do a work in him. So he is crying out for God to do this work in him. Now, here's why I say that he's relying on the nature of God, because God gives us what we do not deserve. David, according to the law, deserved these things. He had committed adultery. He also murdered a man. Yes, I know he put him on the front line. He didn't actually pull the trigger, but he set that murder plot in place. And so what David deserved for his sin was death. That was according to the law of Moses. Take a look at Leviticus chapter 20 and 10 that says if a man commits murder with an, uh, I'm sorry, a man commits adultery with another man's wife, with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress are to be put to death. And murder, look at Numbers chapter 35, verses 16 through 21. And it outlines what intentional murder looks like and that it is punishable by death. If anyone strikes someone with a fatal blow with an iron object, that person is a murderer. The murderer is to be put to death. So David's actions, you know, in committing that adultery with Bathsheba, orchestrating the murder of Uriah, made him guilty of both crimes. Under the law, he is He's, he should be executed. But when the prophet confronts David, instead of a death sentence, God extends to David grace and mercy, and he spares his life. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13. So David, you know, he's still facing significant consequences, right? Including turmoil in his household, the death of the firstborn child to Bathsheba, but he did not receive the death penalty that he legally deserves. So, you know, that's a way of reminding us that, you know, sin does not go unchecked. It may not come, it, you may not get out of something without consequences, but just knowing that you don't get exactly what you deserve lets us see God's grace on display. Here's the thing about David. He doesn't minimize what has gone on. Like he does not, um, 
try to skirt around the issue. He calls sin exactly what it is. Against you, I have sinned. He used the words, not, oh, I made a little mistake. Oh, I slipped up. No, he acknowledges his transgression, his iniquity. Sin means I have missed the mark. It was a deliberate rebellion. It was moral corruption. And when we talk about sin, we cannot as well be afraid to call a thing a thing. My pastor uses those words. Whatever the issue is, you've got to be willing to call that thing out. True repentance um, will call out what you've done. And when I talk about that, I often think about how, you know, prayers sometimes go forth. You know, God, if I've done anything that displeases you, no, no, that's generic. You know what you've done that's displeased God. I know what I've done that didn't make the mark. And when we've done that, he's even, David is even saying that my sin is ever before me. In other words, I don't escape it. I know what it was. It plays in my head. It's got reruns. It haunts me. And so he's saying that this true repentance is I've got to call it out. And I cannot just regret the consequences that were going to come, but I have to, on the inside, regret the actual sin itself. And David knows that he has sinned not just against Bathsheba. He's not sinned just against Uriah, but he says, God, I've sinned against you. I have only sinned against you. And even though he hurt other people, he had a man killed. David knows that this sin was about rebellion against God. Those other things were outward actions, but the harm to the relationship happened in his rebellion with God. And that is the deepest offense, right? When we break God's law, when we violate the holiness of God, that is the deepest issue. And so this tells us that sin is not just about what happens between people. But ultimately, sin has everything to do with our relationship with God. So we've got to be careful that as we make choices, that our choices don't violate relationship. They don't violate covenant with God. David admits that God would be completely justified in condemning him. You know, God's righteous judgment. He says, you know, whatever you do, I would really deserve that. And he knows that because true repentance it's not about excuses. David is not going to God and justifying. Well, now you know God. You know it was a hard time. Well, you know uh, whoever wasn't giving me the attention I need. Well, God, you know it was wartime and I was under a lot of stress. Like, no, David is not making any effort at all to justify his behavior or supply excuses. David is ready to face whatever consequences God sees fit. And he is fully aware that he deserves those consequences. Let's stop and do a few key learnings here. Uh, we have to know that uh, we can't be forgiven by just being good, right? The only way we are forgiven is when we ask God to forgive us, when we have messed up, that we can go confidently to God, just like David does, knowing that God is compassionate and that, you know, his compassion is bigger than our failure. And that's so important. I think a lot of times we are hard on ourselves and we don't have a grace to forgive ourselves, but his compassion is definitely bigger than our failures. But we've got to be honest about what's going on and not make excuses, not sugarcoat things, but literally calling things as they are. That's the only time that we can get ourselves in a place that leads to real healing. All right. It will, we'll never get to the place of real healing if we are not honest and being reminded that ultimately sin, our wrong actions. Yep. They may hurt other people, but the biggest damage is our connection with God. So own up to your mistakes Approach God with confidence and pray that God will open our eyes to the deeper impact of sin. Verses five through nine are not printed in our text, but here David continues like his deep plea for God's cleansing and he wants forgiveness. He is continuing to acknowledge the depth of his sin, the fact that he needs God's mercy. He admits that sin has been a part of his life from the very beginning. This is when he says, you know, I was born in sin. Absolutely. You know, this was, this is something deeper. I was absolutely born in sin and he wants God. I'm trying to see here. Uh, that is in verse five. Indeed, I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. So I was born in sin shaped in iniquity, right? David knows that, that when I came here, I was not right, but he has this desire for truth and for wisdom. He understands that, you know, God wants more 
than just our outward actions. He knows that God goes deeper and he wants God to teach him wisdom on the inside, right? He is, he knows that repentance can be genuine. It's not just a performance. And I think that is so important as we look at this prayer of repentance, it's not just about the words. God is not looking for performance. He is looking at a condition of our heart. So when David requests to be cleansed, he wants God to purify him. Wash me with hyssop and I'll be clean, right? Cleanse me, wash me. I want to be white as snow. David is asking for a complete reset. God hit the reset button on me. Yesterday I had to do an up uh, date on my mother's phone, but we literally had to reset the phone and get the phone in position to even accept this upgrade. Sometimes we've got to ask God for that to hit the reset button on the inside of us. He wants to be clean again. He wants to be renewed. He wants to feel pure. And he wants that as he's sitting under the weight of guilt. And not only does he want to be clean, but after carrying this burden of sin, like David realizes that his joy is gone. And he wants to know joy and gladness again. He wants that back. Give me back my joy. He's asking God to restore his spirit and to lift him up out of what he has been. And he wants his peace back. You know, sin will steal our peace from us. Sin will steal joy from us. And David realizes that. So in this appeal for forgiveness, he just wants God to wipe his slate clean. He knows like this stuff plays in my head. My sin is ever before me. But God, I want you to wipe them out completely. And more than anything, he's asking God to remove the shame and the guilt of his conscience. Verses 10 through 12. This is a passion for purity. We've heard David ask to be clean on the inside, hit this reset button. And now he's got this desire for inner renewal and restoration uh, after having God cleansing him on the inside. He's moving now, it's kind of a shift from just confessing his sin to asking God now for restoration. He's already acknowledged his guilt. He's already asked for mercy and now there's something on the inside. It's this complete renewal of his heart. David recognizes that like forgiveness alone is not enough. He needs transformation on the inside and all of us should want that. God clean me from the inside out. He wanted God to create in him. He asked for this. I told you about those 11 actions. He's saying, create in me a clean heart. This is from the Hebrew word that literally means God makes something out of nothing. Give me a clean heart. Don't just fix up the heart that's in there. Don't just wipe off the one that's in there, but literally asking God to give me something that is completely new. That's that reset button we talked about, the reset on the inside, acknowledging that only God, check this out. He's not saying, well, God, I can do this if you just give me the steps. No, God, you create in me something that doesn't exist today that is brand new. And David also asked for a steadfast spirit. He wants consistency, right? And that's the thing, like life is not about these constant, just always, you know, yes, we have access to go to God and be forgiven, but we should not live in a pattern where we're always planning to do a wrong thing and just know that we can depend on, you know, God's grace. Shall we continue in sin, less grace abound? God forbid, right? David is asking for consistency. He is asking for stability in his relationship with God. And he knows that he's been swayed by temptation. He knows that, you know, no good thing lies in this flesh, right? There are desires in this flesh, but he wants more than anything to be loyal and to be committed to God. So he knows in the future, there are going to be challenges in the future, but God, I want you to help me to be consistent. And don't throw me away, God. Don't cast me away. That was David's biggest fear, being cast away from God's presence. And, you know, that wasn't really unfounded, right? The, the predecessor, his predecessor, Saul, what, what happened with Saul? Go take a look. All right. So it was not completely unfounded that, you know, God, he's looked at past kings and past leaders and God has rejected some leaders and God, David doesn't want that. Right. He says, don't cast me away from your presence. He's seen how sin can cause a separation from God. And so I, I love it when I looked at this, like his, his, his concern is not even just the punishment. His biggest fear is not the punishment. 
His biggest fear is losing his intimate relationship with God. And I believe that if we would prioritize relationship with God over just trying to figure out all the little bitty actions, but literally leading with God, I want to love you. God, I want this relationship with you. God, I want to keep relationship intact with you. I think it would really change how we move. He wants his closeness back with God. And then he asked God not to take his spirit from him. And this is a big deal because it shows that David understands the role of the spirit of God in empowering him to live right. And I'll tell you this, my brothers and my sisters, there is nothing good in us that just allows us to live good on our own because we're just great people. It requires the spirit of God on the inside of us. And David knew that he was powerless to live a righteous life without the spirit of God. So his request, his cry was for the spirit of God. And then sin had stolen David's joy. And he said to God, he wanted to be restored in that area. The sense of like that on the inside, this the spiritual delight, the peace that comes with being in right relationship with God. He wanted that back. So, you know, joy is not just an emotion, right? Joy is about the deep co contentment that comes with knowing that you're forgiven, with knowing that you're in harmony with God, right relationship with God. And David knows that that only comes from God's salvation. And I love this because David, like this final request was a willing spirit. He asked for like this inner strength that not only keeps him on the right path, but willing, a willing heart that seeks after God. Do you have a heart today that is willing to seek after God, not just about avoiding sin, but literally pursuing God with passion, with intentionality? Do you pursue God in that way? So we more than forgiveness, key learnings here. We need transformation, right? So that's why I continue to say it's not about simple I'm sorry's. It's not about that. We need to ask God to change us from the inside out. Why? So that we don't continue falling in patterns of sin again and again. And we need that consistency in our faith. Life is going to uh, deal pressure. There's going to always be temptation. You and I daily, we're going to face temptation that can pull us off track. And that comes in lots of different ways. With David, it was temptation in his flesh with a woman. For others, it's temptation in finances. It's temptation in a, your integrity. But whatever those things are that can pull you off track, we should ask God for like this steady um, spirit that does not quit, the one that stays faithful even when temptation is in front of us. And we should value the presence of God. I, I'm at a point now in relationship with God. I'm not a perfect person. I'm not at all. But I know the difference in as I mature in life, right? And as a believer, that there were things, I think as a child, you know, you didn't want to get in trouble. You wanted to avoid the punishment of a thing. And I think I kind of led with that in my faith for many years, you know. And, and for a lot of us, it's all, oh, you know, I don't want to go to hell. And I don't. I don't, but that's not what I lead with. I don't want to live a life that is all fear-based and, oh, you know, hell. No, I don't want that. God is a God of love. And more than anything, I enjoy, I value relationship with God. And so I want to lead with the fact that I want my love back for him to be reflected in the choices that I make. I choose and I renew my commitment to love him every single day. And for me, that's less about avoiding punishment, but it is about living the best life that he has designed for me and walking in the love that he has for me and loving him back daily in my decisions. Our last section of the passage is going to be in verses 15 through 17. 13 and 14, I don't want to skip over them. David is asking for personal forgiveness and he's focusing on what he's going to do when he is restored by God. What will you do when God restores you? What is this restoration all for? And I didn't want to skip over verse 13 because that was a big one for me. Then when you do all these things for me, then I realized it was not just for me that I have a responsibility. When you do this, then I want to make a commitment. He makes a pledge to God that if God forgives him and restores him, he's not going to keep it to himself. 
He says, I'm going to go and I'm going to become a testimony and I'm going to teach others your ways. David recognizes that his experience with God's mercy can help others who are struggling. And I believe that today there are others who are struggling with sin. There are people who are struggling with rebellion. And when they see the restoration of God in our lives, for some of us, you know, your testimony on display is the biggest thing that God wants to use because it becomes this opportunity for others to see that God can do a work in you and it will lead them to God. And in some cases, it's going to lead people back to God. So his desire to help others to turn to God, because David knows firsthand sin separates from God. And now he's committed to using his testimony to show others that there is a path to repentance. There is a path back from brokenness. There is a path back from separation. I want to say that today. I want to pause in this lesson to let you know if you are one of my friends who, for whatever reason, has found yourself in a place that is away from God. God wants to move you back today into position. He wants to fix that brokenness between you. He wants you to find your way back to him. God loves you. And there is nothing that you have done. Y'all, we're talking about a man who committed adultery and had a man murdered. A man who was not honest. A man who on the inside had ugly desires. And there is nothing that was so bad that God could not and did not forgive him. So when David makes this plea of forgiveness, he calls on God to deliver him from that guilt. And today I want to speak to that. The guilt. I release you today from the guilt that the enemy wants to keep you in that makes you feel that God will never be able to forgive you for what is done. No, God will forgive you today and you can be released of that guilt. Make a commitment. What are you going to do when God does these things? Like a David, what are you going to do? What will you commit to doing? David commits to teaching others God's ways and he also commits to praise. Once he's forgiven, he is not going to be silent. He is going to sing out loud about God's righteousness and what he has done. He'd be public about it. Our final verses are a praise from a penitent or a penitent, repentant. That another word, that's what penitent means, a repentant person. Um, he is, this is so genuine. Like this song, uh, this song, which is a song, is so genuine uh, because it is about David's realization that God desires a humble and a repentant heart over rituals. When you've messed up, you can't out church your mess ups. You can't out serve your mess ups. The only way to deal with our mess ups is to do it in a way that is real, that is raw, that is truly repentant. And so in this final section of David's confession, there is a shift to right from this personal transformation to this public expression of his newfound heart where David, you know, desires more than just this inward renewal. He's going to openly praise God. He's going to demonstrate that God has restored his relationship. He says, I'm opening my lips. He's opening his mouth. He's going to declare God's praise. He is going, he, he's, it, see, guilt and shame and sin, they will silence you. They will embarrass you. Right after going through the guilt and the shame of all that, David knows now that he has this ability to worship God, and it only comes because God has given him this mercy. So, sin that blocked relationship with God, and it does that right when you are in sin, that's what makes it so hard to praise God. I didn't say it makes it hard to show up at church, I didn't say it makes it hard to look like you're doing the right things in front of people, but true and authentic praise cannot happen where sin is the blocker. Right. So it makes it hard for us to praise God authentically. But once we've been restored, there is a praise that naturally flows from a heart that is forgiven. And David recognizes that. Right. That true worship begins when God removes the weight of sin, when God restores the joy. That is the place of like true celebration. So, you know, God desires more than sacrifice. And David mentions that God's not just looking for ritual. He's not just looking for offerings. 
And that's why I continue to mention he's not impressed with our church attendance. We're supposed to be there, right, for the community of fellowship and faith. And I believe that we grow. I think there's incredible benefit in being there. But if we only come to the house of God to be seen out of ritual and then we go and we live lives of sin where uh, the, the things that we do daily don't reflect the heart of God, that's ritual. Right. When your conversation doesn't reflect the heart of God, but we're doing all the other things, that's ritual. When the things that we uh, eat and drink and consume uh, in the places that we go, the things that we choose to take in. If we're not doing the right things in our lifestyle, all those other things simply become ritual. And so David realizes that God is not concerned about these religious acts. He truly wants genuine repentance. And again, repentance is more than I'm sorry. Repentance is a change of direction. It is a 180. It is turning your back on those things that displease God. When he uses this phrase, a broken spirit, he's not talking about being crushed or defeated, but he's talking about a spirit that is humble, one that is truly contrite. David's spirit was broken. He was broken because he was so aware of his sin. And he's no longer like he, he knows. He's not, he's not proud of that, right? He's not self-sufficient. He's saying that he's put himself in a place of humility and a place of surrender. And that is what God desires. God wants that more than all the other stuff. God wants humility. He wants surrender more than he wants a ritual. God wants humility. He wants surrender more than he wants a ritual. So that's that broken and a contrite heart. That's the complete opposite of being arrogant. That's not somebody who can work it out on their own. That's why I say when you look at this text, like there, this is not about anything that David can do on his own. Every action that he's been asking for has been, God, I need you to do this. In order for me to be cleaned up, in order for me to get right, you've got to do a work in me. So what is the work that God needs to do in you, right? How do you use your words to ask God to do the work in you? And David closes this prayer, which is powerful with the truth. You know, God is not going to despise. He's not going to turn away from someone who will come to him with a humble and a repentant heart. So this is a message of hope, right? Even after our deepest failures, God welcomes us. He's not going to turn away when we come and simply ask for his forgiveness. He's not going to turn away when we come and say, change me, oh God. When we say, God, clean me up from the inside. There is nothing. And I can't say this enough because I don't know who will see this video. There is nothing. There is no sin that is too great that a truly repentant heart cannot bring before God. There is nothing. So whatever those things are, I encourage you to um, get in a space where you get in the face of God. God is more interested in our hearts than he is our rituals. You know, we can't fake our way into God's favor. He sees past all the other stuff. He sees past religious motions. He wants a repentant heart and God will never turn away from us. There are more notes in my notes and you can grab those, but I know I've gone long. Once again, I told y'all it's been different. These have been some really great lessons, but again, I'm really struck by the rawness of David. I am struck by his honesty in this passage. He is real. He is raw. He is ready for change. Are you real? Are you ready to be raw before God? And are you ready for change? Are you ready to admit your failures and cry out for mercy? And for David, that's what I see in this text. And I think that we can do that. Um, and I know that I can do that. In fact, my summary is always personal, that I can be real, I can be raw, and I can be ready, um, that I don't have to wrestle you know, with my shortcomings. I have to be realistic about my shortcomings, but also know that I can take them to God. Um, I can know that when I mess up, I don't have to be afraid to repent, that it's more than just sorry. Uh, I look at David, he wanted more than forgiveness. He wanted transformation. And I think that that's so important that we must desire transformation from the inside out. There's a process I do see in this week's lesson. It starts with acknowledging my sin and taking responsibility for it, uh, that I can ask God to clean me up and to renew my spirit um, it's not just about being forgiven, but it's about being changed from the inside out. And then I can be moved into a place of authentic worship where my words and my actions reflect the transformation that has actually happened in my heart. My word of the week is repent. 
R is for recognizing my sin and taking full responsibility, knowing that I can't hide my failures from God. Secondly, expressing my need for God's mercy and his forgiveness and understand that only his grace can restore me. My P is for pursuing, pursuing purity by asking God to do that washing, to clean me up and renewing the spirit in me, a right spirit in me. Um, embracing restoration. That's my E that comes from God as he restores the joy of salvation. And y'all salvation is joyful, right? I forgot to mention that. Like, do you remember when you first came to God? Right. I think life can do a number on us. And sometimes we get so lost in the things that are going on and kind of burdened down with things that are taking place. But there is a joy in salvation. It is not meant to be burdensome. So restore the joy of our our salvation and, you know, give me the strength to walk in his ways. My end is for nurturing the heart of a true worshiper, allowing the praise of God to flow from what I've experienced with God. And that's why I even talk about with my Sunday school lessons. I'm not out here just trying to create a YouTube brand like I am a teacher and like this heart of a teacher, the heart of a worshiper, part of my worship is my teaching. And so, you know, I want the the praise and the joy of, you know, the space that God has given me to flow out of this experience that he's given me and the grace that he shows me. And I know about his forgiveness. I know about his grace as I open up his word. So that's kind of my overflow. And then my T is for trust that I will trust that God uh, values a humble and a repentant heart over any of religious the religious activities uh, or any offering that I can give, offering my time, talent, or treasure, like God values a repentant heart over all that. That's our lesson for this week. Again, there's so much in the notes. You can grab those down below. Uh, but if there's anything that you'd like to add or anything that you got from this lesson, I'd love for you to leave a comment. Yes, I do read them. I read them personally, and I'll look forward to sharing with you. I love you all so very much. I invite you to share with this ministry if it's been a blessing to you and you'll see on the exit screen exit screens ways that you're able to do that i love you all so much and i'll see you in sunday school bye everybody thank you so much for studying with me this week i want to remind you of my ask please that you support me with the gift of nine dollars and if you've never done so before tip over to my etsy store if you're looking for great gifts for sunday school students or maybe a student who wants to celebrate your teacher superintendent who wants gifts Go and check out the Etsy store. There are t-shirts, tote bags, candles, pouches, you name it, all celebrating Sunday school. So there are at least eight different designs for both Sunday school and church school. So check them out. And if you've not already done so, check out my book on Amazon. So many of you have ordered it and I've got incredible feedback and I appreciate you so much. I'm excited about this devotional, which says it's for Sunday school teachers, but honestly, it works for anyone serving in any space, ministry or even corporate spaces. So if you're looking for a devotional to encourage you along your way, check it out. Love you and see you all soon.